Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Uh, and thanks to everyone at LL Bean, uh, Bill and Ashley, uh, for inviting me back to speak again. Um, our, the topic of the program uh, today is the uh, Pacific Crest Trail and the six month hike that I took along it in 2019. Now, the uh, little bit of background on the Pacific Crest Trail, uh, it's one of 11 National Scenic Trails, uh, including the Appalachian Trail, the Continental Divide Trail. It's 2,653 miles long, most of that, a good chunk of that is in California. And um, it, it uh, extends from the Mexican border in Southern California uh, through the, the deserts of, of Southern California, um, into the Sierra Nevada, across the crest of the Sierra, into Oregon and Washington through the Cascades and ends at Manning Park in Canada. And it goes through a whole slew of, uh, of protected lands. Most of the trail is protected. National parks, forests, monuments, uh, wilderness areas. It, it's a really wild and beautiful trail. One of the most amazing statistics, uh, at least for me, about the Pacific Crest Trail and getting from one end to the other is the amount of uh, elevation gain along the way, more than 489,000 feet. And just for comparison's sake, uh, the Appalachian Trail from one end to the other, uh, you have to gain 265,000 feet. So it's, uh, I know the trail is a little bit longer, 400, almost 500 miles longer, but that's a lot more elevation gain and um, it's pretty wild. 489,000 feet, by the way, if you look at it, is uh, about the equivalent of hiking Katahdin every day and a half with a full pack. So keep that in mind. My journey began on April 3rd at the Mexican border at Campo, 50 miles east of San Diego. I started out with a friend I uh, had met on the AT in 2015. The journey ended on October 8th, uh, a few miles north of Stevens Pass in Washington uh, at mile marker 24-7. I was a little bit shy of my uh, goal of finishing the entire trail, but uh, as you can see from the conditions pictured there, things had gotten uh, a little crazy by that point. I'll tell you all about that. Some other stats uh, to uh, tell you about the trail, my hike. I was out 187 days. I averaged a little over 13 mile, uh, miles a day. That was, that's a raw average. And I guess when I take out the, uh, the days off and, and whatnot, the average is a little higher, maybe 16 or 17 miles a day. I lost 32 pounds on the PCT hike. Uh, that's the exact same amount I lost uh, on the AT. And that got me right back to my high school fighting weight, which is pretty incredible. Uh, and also I had no blisters, not even a hot spot. And I, I contribute that to um, the boots that work for me, Loa Renegades. I've had six pairs of them now over about 6,000 miles of hiking. And for me, they're, they're just amazing. This journey on the PCT uh, is one that I've had in mind for a long time, ever since I read The High Adventure of Eric Ryback back in 1975. Uh, and I, I, I hiked the Appalachian Trail for the first time in 77. And soon after that, I bought the hike planning guide for the PCT, intent on doing it in, I don't know, 78, 79, sometime. And then uh, as many of you know, um, life gets in the way and college and jobs and all that happy stuff. And I never got to it until 2019. I did. Uh, uh, carry the, uh, the the patch I had saved for more than 40 years, the PCT patch, which, which doesn't look like that anymore. Uh, I found it, I kept it, I found it a little a uh, few weeks before the hike, and I put it on the back of my pack, and uh, I was pretty happy to have that with me the whole way. I also had a patch on the, the pack uh, to remind me of home, Acadia National Park. So the PCT at the Mexican border. Uh, early on in a big hike, you're looking for any and all milestones. One mile in, uh, three miles in, at Lake Morena, 20 miles in from the border. You're, uh, it, you're very keyed in on, uh, on measuring your progress so that uh, you can say, wow, I, I actually am getting somewhere after hiking day after day. One of the other things you're looking for early on in the hike is water. Um, water is very important, of course, in the desert. Water is life. Um, 
and it had been a, a, a very wet spring, very wet winter uh, out west, and there was lots of water. I was very fortunate. There was lots of natural water. In fact, uh, the first day in the first 12 miles, um, there must have been 20 water sources, and this was really unheard of. Um, there were places that had been dry for two decades, and all of a sudden everything was flowing with water. So I, I had a real good time of it as far as uh, water and not having to carry a whole heck of a lot through the desert. There were other sources as well, uh, horse troughs, um, pipe springs, and water caches that were maintained by volunteers. Um, th these were really terrific along the way. The volunteers are, are the trail angels are amazing. Um, and then, you know, there were some sources that didn't look so good, but actually like that green cattle trough. But, you know, you dip your water, your water bottle down in there and the water's clear and, and you're, you're treating most everything anyway. So um, it didn't matter. The other cool thing about uh, the wet winter and spring out west was this incredible super bloom of wildflowers. These are uh, California golden poppies, which were just amazing. There are wildflowers of, of every kind out there. And I had wildflowers for pretty much four, the first four months of the hike. Um, so it was, it was uh, beautiful, just beautiful to walk through. And the cacti, not just the wildflowers, the cacti as well. And I, I don't know my flowers very well. I know just a few, but uh, I appreciated them nonetheless. The other thing uh, you might not realize about the Southern California desert is that there's snow. And early on in the hike, about 10 days in, uh, we had to go over Mount San Jacinto, which takes a couple, three days. And that's uh, 10,000, almost 11,000 feet. The PCT goes over at about the 9,000 foot level. And there was plenty of snow up there. And that presented some early navigational issues. Um, uh, but uh, because I was carrying the uh, Gut Hooks uh, PCT app on my iPhone, um, getting through the snowy parts where you, you couldn't see the trail um, wasn't, uh, wasn't that big a deal. It was, it was a pain um, to, to, to figure out where you needed to go, but you always knew you were going to pretty much always knew you were going to find the trail and keep moving forward. And there was snow up. Uh, in the Big Bear area, there was snow on Mount Baden-Powell a little further north. This is about 400 miles into the hike. Um, snow, snow is a, it played a big factor, a, a big role in, in my hike in 2019. There was also snow in the Tehachapis, um, which was pretty incredible. Um, it's not uncommon, but um, we got uh, six or eight inches of really heavy, wet snow and had a pretty miserable night, a whole bunch of us here in the middle of the Tehachapis. And of course, while it was snowing in the Tehachapis a few inches, it was snowing feet in the Sierra. And that, that was a problem. That was going to be a problem. It already was a problem. The other thing about the desert, of course, is it gets hot. You've got the, uh, the juxtaposition of snow and desert heat. Um, which, uh, you know, you've got everything thrown at you on the Pacific Crest Trail. Uh, here's uh, Iron Lady uh, 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 plodding around uh, out uh, off the San Jacinto Range, headed for I-10, and it's probably 92 in, in this uh, photo. We had a bunch of days in the 90s, which was hot, but it could have been a lot worse. Never got over 100, so uh, we, we, we managed pretty good, uh, and all, all things considered. The, uh, the, the probably the longest uh, stretch of out in the open walking is uh, that, that a lot of hikers do at night and, and a bunch of us did is walking along the, uh, the, the edge of the northern edge of the Mojave Desert, uh, which follows the, uh, the route follows the Los Angeles Aqueduct, which we're walking on top of there. Um, we did what most hikers do. We uh, rested during the heat of the day at Hiker Town and then struck off in the late afternoon when it had cooled some and walked into the night, uh, covering about 20 miles by one o'clock in the morning and ended up just crashing at, on top of a, uh, the concrete pump station along the aqueduct. Um, <laughs> very tired after having walked a long way and stumbling around in the dark for all those hours. And these early days were wonderful. I, I think the biggest thing I got out of the PCT was uh, all, all these cool campsites. You're, you're staying someplace different every night and you're always up, well, most of the time you're up high and you have a view and uh, it's really beautiful. 
And of course, the other thing is uh, meeting the people along the way, all the hikers from around the country and around the world. And I made some really good friends and had some great nights out on the trail um, and made some good friends, good friends. And of course, in town, you know, all bets are off when you get in town and you have a few beers and, uh, and some margaritas and you have some fun. Uh, lots of good laughs and uh, again, just some great people. Oh, and, and there's more. Uh, so this was shopping for sun hats in, uh, in Ridgecrest. We didn't buy those, but uh, I thought we were looking good as models there. Uh, also met uh, a few friends along the way that old Maine friends like my friend Tim. We go back to Bangor High School many, many years ago. He's been living out in California for a long time. Tim, we, we spent a couple of days with Tim, uh, you know, got the, the usual the shower, uh, laundry, a uh, few good meals in us. I got to rest up a little bit, write in the journal. Uh, Tim was kind enough to pack a two pound rock in my pack when I left. Uh, of course, I didn't find that um, uh, until 20 miles uh, or so up the trail after having climbed uh, uh, 4,000 4, feet or so. So thank you, Tim. That was a beautiful rock you gave me. And it, and it was signed even, how about that? Oh, and I also found Cheryl Strade's boot, her lost boot. And if you've read Wild, you know exactly what I mean. My friend, uh, uh, Iron Lady uh, hurt her knee uh, along the way at about the 400 mile mark and uh, took a week off and met me again at the 500 mile mark, hoping to get back on the trail, just wasn't gonna be. So her hike ended there and I ended up carrying on alone for a while. 702 miles into the journey, um, you reach Kennedy Meadows, which is the official start of the Sierra Nevada. Now everybody's gotta make a big decision, no matter the year when you reach Kennedy Meadows, do I push on through the Sierra or do I do something different? Now the, the Sierra Nevada uh, ahead is uh, four or five, 600 miles or so of high elevation remote terrain. Uh, and there were 10, 20 feet or more of snow this year uh, in 2019 ahead of me, everybody. Uh, there was anywhere from 168% to 212% of the normal snowpack. And it, as I told you, it had uh, kept on snowing uh, uncharacteristically through the spring while I was out on the trail. So uh, it was going to be a big deal to push straight on through the Sierra at the end of May. I could have waited a couple of weeks, but this year there was so much snow, it just wasn't going to make a difference. So I had to make a decision. Like I said, we all did. So here's where everybody scattered hither and yon. This was my, part of my trail family who I loved very much. Um, a, a bunch of people pushed on through the Sierra. Uh, a, a bunch of people said, you know what, this is too much. I've had it, my hike is over. And others like me and my friend Ranger up here in the, uh, the second from left, um, we decided to do something different. And looking at the, 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 the maps of the trail and the snow reports and whatnot of where things were, um, there was heavy snow all over the trail. Uh, we decided to uh, flip up to Southern Oregon to a place called Fish Lake and hike south from there, hoping that the lower elevations of Northern California would have less snow. And by the time we got to the uh, long stretch of the Sierra Nevada, um, that most of it would be melted out. And as it turned out, it was a perfect plan. Now, what I hadn't planned on was uh, on the hike into Kennedy Meadows was getting really, really sick. Um, it was Jardia, a norovirus, I don't know. So this made traveling north to do the flip-flop uh, up to Oregon uh, pretty miserable because that took a hitchhike, um, two local buses, two Amtrak trains, and another bus to get us up there. 27 hours of traveling, as sick as I was, was really, really miserable. And when I got to Oregon, um, things just got worse. I ended up going to the hospital to get some uh, antibiotics. Um, and uh, turns out it wasn't ba uh, bacterial at all. It was probably a norovirus, but um, it, it knocked me off the trail for eight or, or nine days, which, which was big in the scheme of things when you're trying to push um, through in a, in a defined period before it snows in, in Washington. So finally got back on the trail in early June with Ranger in the middle and uh, my friend Billy, high five. 
Uh, on the left, he had hiked a lot with us uh, uh, down in the southern part of the trail, and off we went. There at the base of uh, Mount McLaughlin, uh, going south through the, uh, the uh, southern portion, portion of Oregon into California, which we reached in uh, two, three days. So we're now traveling south, and as you can see, it's beautiful country in Northern California at an elevation of five or 6,000 feet. Yeah, there was snow, but it was very manageable. We had to use micro spikes here and there, occasionally our ice axe, but for the most part, um, uh, what we had hoped for turned out to be exactly what we uh, got on the ground. And it's wild country, uh, the Northern California, Marble Mountain Wilderness, the Trinity Alps, um, really beautiful, uh, breathtaking terrain. And ever you're making this huge arc around Mount Shasta for about three weeks and 300 miles. And it's always getting closer. And you can see Mount Shasta, Shasta from uh, pretty much every day for that entire length of time. And I uh, got to really uh, love, love those views of, four, that's 14,000 feet, Mount Shasta. There are a lot of great campsites at beautiful lakes and ponds. Um, there was a lot of uh, wildflowers again, uh, always, and uh, bears. I saw six bears in Northern California um, and they bolted uh, off the trail, uh, scared of me more than I was scared of them every time. I had Bernie Falls, beautiful Bernie Falls. I met up with another friend from Maine who lives out in Chico now, that's Kristen at the head of the table. She fixed us a bunch of good meals. We met up with uh, two new hiker friends of ours, Navi and Ritz, hiked with them for a few weeks. So we expanded our group and we're having a pretty darn good time. Oh, and, and at, at about this time for a couple of week period in, in uh, Northern California, uh, a lot of the folks who had either pushed through the Sierras or had skipped around to other parts, uh, hoping for less snow, they started to show up northbound. So every day, for this period, we, we were always running into one or two, four or five of people, uh, friends that we hadn't seen for weeks and weeks and weeks. And of course, the big question always was, well, how were the Sierras? How, how did you manage? And the, uh, the answer was invariably, oh my gosh, they were beautiful. I loved it. But I also, they were dangerous as hell and I, I should have died. Someone should have died every day and I would never do it again. So. Based on that, I think I made the right decision, um, at least for me. Anyway. Yeah, lots of smiling faces. Met some great folks. I got friends for life from the Pacific Crest Trail. Lassen National Park, after the hot and dusty uh, Hat Creek Rim, marks the beginning of the Sierra. So I was getting there, making good progress. Lassen was beautiful, but I was anxious to get to the Sierras and carry on. Now a journey like the PCT, uh, when you're gonna be gone from home for six months, takes a lot of planning. There's a lot of material out there. You've got maps, you've got the information on where to mail mail drops, where to get resupplies, what's in, you know, what towns are where, what's available, where to buy fuel, all of that. And I did all of that research for the third time in five years. Um, so it was getting a little easier after the 18, 2015, and the Florida Trail in 17. And as usual, I boiled everything down into a spreadsheet that uh, I carried with me. And for the most part, even with the flip flop, this, uh, this spreadsheet of uh, information um, really um, paid the big dividends uh, throughout the hike. Here's my uh, gear kit, the big three, um, Osprey pack, uh, in the green bag, big Agnes copper spur tent, REI Magma sleeping bag and a whole bunch of other things. This is pretty much what I carried the entire way. I, my, my kit varied very little. In the upper left here are the clothes I wore for the most part. Uh, the electronics bag, camera, battery charger, wall charger, a wall plug, uh, cords, that kind of thing. Gear for the, uh, the snow country and a Garmin InReach Mini, which I didn't want to carry. I didn't want at first, but my wife and my mom uh, insisted. And I'll tell you what, I'm sold on it now. I'm glad I had it. It was uh, great to be able to be in touch via satellite. And if something went wrong, I could pull the SOS plug. Not that I wanted to. Oh, and my lower renegade boots, um, three pairs, no blisters. Food, 
I ate everything and anything. When you're hiking a long trail like the PCT, you're eating, well, you're, 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 uh, you're, you're burning four or five, 6,000 calories a day. You can't eat that much, but you eat as much as you possibly can. And uh, from my menus on the other two uh, big hikes, I knew pretty much what I wanted and I carried a lot of the same things, you know, jerky and cheese and, and crackers and, and tuna and uh, candy and chocolate and snacks and that kind of thing, lots of it. And I ate it all. Uh, dinners were uh, a combination of freeze dried foods and, and store bought things. And for the most part, my menu served me well and I, I didn't get tired of it. So the Sierra Nevada, absolutely beautiful country. I'm getting into the higher terrain here, um, at eight, 9,000 feet. And there is still a lot of snow, but there would have been a whole heck of a lot more snow had I come through the other way uh, earlier on. So it was still very manageable, very beautiful. The Sierra, oh my gosh, this was my second or third time through, fourth time through uh, parts of the, uh, the Sierra and I love them every time. Still wildflowers. It was hard to take a bad photograph in the Sierra. They're just so beautiful. More great campsites. This is uh, uh, Billy and, and Ranger and I at Lake Aloha in the Desolation Wilderness. Lots of wildflowers still and uh, really lovely walking. And for, let's see, what it, it uh, rained four times while I was in the Sierra. And incredibly, three of those times I was inside in the hostel or in town. Um, so <clears throat> for the most part, the weather was beautiful. Oh, and some of the campsites, I mean, just shoot me. Um, I love mountaintop camping and on the Pacific Crest Trail, you get plenty of opportunity for that. Interestingly, the start of the Sierra, either way, coming from the south going north or from the north going south, you, you end up at a place called Kennedy Meadows, which is confusing sometimes, but it is what it is. Kennedy Meadows uh, is where I picked up a, a bear canister. They're required for that 400 mile stretch. And uh, I, boy, I rented it for 20 bucks. Um, I had a love-hate relationship with the bear canister. It's awkward. It doesn't fit in your pack very well. It doesn't really hold a week's worth of food, but you've got to have it. The only good thing about it really, I guess, in the end, is that it, it makes a good seat <laughs> when, you, when you're looking for someplace to sit in camp. Other than that, forget about it. I don't want the thing. After uh, Kennedy Meadows, the, the terrain around uh, Sonora Pass was just so starkly beautiful. Just rock and snow and ice and blue sky. And then we were on to uh, Yosemite, Tuolumne Falls, the Tuolumne River. Um, really, uh, Yosemite is so near and dear to my heart. And it goes by all too quickly. This is the uh, first of the high passes in the, in the real high Sierra. This is our camp, my camp at 11,000 feet at Donahue Pass. And the terrain from there just got more beautiful. This is Banner Peak, Mount Ritter and uh, Thousand Island Lake. And every day, beautiful granite, uh, granite mountains, uh, the sparse forests, and uh, the beautiful, uh, beautiful blue lakes. Perhaps my favorite campsite of the entire trek was that atop Muir Pass. That's a hut built by the Sierra Club uh, in honor of John Muir. Uh, Muir Pass is at 12,000 feet. Spent the night there just as I wanted to. I'd done that one time before back in the 90s. That's my tent over here. Um, uh, and oh, what a night. Watch the moon rise and the sun go down. And uh, you are in such a wild situation up there. Um, it's like being in the, in the Karakoram of Pakistan, but that's how it felt to me. Beautiful. And the sun going down over Wanda Lake really uh, sticks with me. So for about 200 miles, the PCT and the John Muir Trail coincide more or less. And uh, it was fairly busy out on the trail. A lot of uh, hikers out for their two or three weeks on the Muir Trail uh, with their big packs. And so it was a lot of company. Uh, campsites actually had, a, you know, the, the, some of them were fairly crowded, but it, it was cool. Um, but ever the beautiful terrain, the, uh, the lovely lakes. And uh, so every day through the Sierra, the high Sierra, there was a, there was a high pass to cross at 11,000 feet or 12,000 feet. And this is, uh, 
hikers coming down Glen Pass as I'm going up. Some days, because of the way the, you know, the schedule worked, you had to do two passes, and those were, were big days. That was, uh, that was pretty arduous. The highest of all the passes, the highest point on the entire Pacific Crest Trail is Forrester Pass, this V-shaped notch way the heck up here at a little over 13,000 feet. And that was a big milestone for sure. Uh, after that is Bighorn Flats. And I was determined that if the weather was good, I was going to climb Mount Whitney, which doesn't look like much from this side. That's Mount Whitney over here to the left, 14,000 and a half, 14,500 feet. It is the highest point in the contiguous United States. And the weather was good and I decided I'm going up. It's a 15 mile round trip uh, side trail, um, but totally worth it. I had probably the best day of the entire hike up there. Um, that's my summit view. This is a long trail crest uh, as I'm going up to the peak. This is the top of the mountain right there. And that was part of my view. Boy, you can see forever up there. The highest point in the uh, contiguous United States. You gotta love it. Finally, about four days after Whitney, uh, Ranger and I, Billy had dropped off the trail a couple of weeks back, had to get back to Oregon. So it was my friend Ranger and I, we, we connected the dots to Kennedy Meadows at the, and now had completed 1,700 miles of the trail. Billy and his wife Mandy drove all the way down from Oregon to pick us up, transport us back to Oregon. So I've now completed all the trail in blue northbound, all the trail in red southbound, and I'm going to complete the journey on the PCT um, going northbound through Oregon and Washington. Now in Oregon, I met up with my wife, Fran, who had left Maine with the camper and the truck in mid-July. It's now getting to be late August. And Fran would uh, shadow me and uh, my buddies um, for the rest of the way through the journey, which was really cool. The first thing uh, out of the box no, going north from Fish Lake uh, was Crater Lake. Crater Lake is so beautiful. It's the deepest lake in, in the United States. And my goodness, it is the most beautiful. It, it's a stunning place. I must have taken 100 photos as I walked the nine miles around the, the western edge. Uh, that's Wizard Island out there in the middle. Oh, breathtaking, just breathtaking. Oregon is really cool. The, the weather was good for the most part. It's a lot like hiking in, um, in Maine, except for you've got 10, 11,000 foot volcanoes. Uh, other than that, the woods, the, the waters, the lakes, uh, ponds uh, all look uh, a lot like, like Maine. So with my wife out there uh, following us along, we were able to slack pack a lot of days. I was just carrying a light pack and covering bigger miles. Uh, and that had, you know, and or we would uh, just carry a, a light backpack of two, three days food. And uh, whenever Fran would meet us, we would be able to get to a campground, eat some good meals, drink some cold beer. Um, so that that was a lot of fun, a real bonus. And the same thing with uh, Billy's wife, Mandy. She would meet us all over the place and bring uh, supplies, cold beer, cold sodas for us. And we'd be able to cook some meals that we wouldn't normally have. So. Oregon was a real, uh, a, a lot of fun. And I won't say it was easy, but it was easier thanks to uh, Fran and Mandy uh, and their, uh, their trail engine. So Oregon through the Sisters Wilderness, um, wonderful walking, um, beautiful terrain, uh, and into the lava fields uh, in, the, in the central part of the state, which was really wild country. Um, this is, uh, hiking up Belknap Crater. We probably had 20 miles of these uh, black lava fields, which were pretty tough on the feet. Crossed the 2,000 mile mark near Oregon's Mount Washington. Um, looked out for Bigfoot danger all the time. And uh, on, on the trail in Oregon, it's, it's pretty wet. So there were a lot of these uh, banana slugs, which are five, six inches long. <laughs> They're, they're kind of the cool looking, but the creepy at the same time. Finally, Mount Hood, the highest point in Oregon, the trail uh, makes an arc around the Western slopes for a couple of days. And uh, you reach Timberline Lodge. It's so beautiful, such a beautiful mountain. You reach Timberline Lodge uh, at 6,000 feet on, on the side of the mountain. And uh, you might recognize this 
the, the facade for Timberline Lodge was used in Stephen King's movie, The Shining. And of course, at the reception desk, they have an ax behind the, uh, the counter there that everybody has to get their picture taken with. And on, on the handle are the words, here's Johnny. So I kind of love that. After Mount Hood though, goodness, the weather started to turn bad. You know, I lost a lot of time uh, here and there in the hike. Um, I didn't keep pace like I should have probably. And uh, the weather was turning. It was, it's getting late September now, um, probably the 20th of September and the weather's turning. So I had to hustle. So Washington, the last 500 miles, I crossed the Columbia River on the Bridge of the Gods and I was moving, but the weather wasn't cooperating very well. Um, when it was good though, Washington was a sweet place to hike. Um, it was uh, looking like fall, um, not, not the fall we have in Maine because of places like uh, Mount Adams, but uh, it's pretty country. Um, but uh, a lot of fall colors, it's getting late, still some wildflowers, incredibly, uh, lots of mushrooms, colorful mushrooms. Oh my gosh, loved it. Uh, and blueberries, blueberries and huckleberries. So we, uh, we wasted some time picking bags full of, uh, of those and enjoying those. When the weather in Washington was, was good, it was, it, the, it was so beautiful out. Uh, some of the prettiest terrain uh, that I've ever hiked through. And on days like this, this is heading into the Goat Rocks Wilderness. My goodness, it was, it was beautiful. And the Goat Rocks was fabulous. It was really screaming windy and uh, cloudy for the most part. Had I had a nicer afternoon, uh, I would have had a big view of Mount Rainier right here, but I didn't get it on that day. Um, but I enjoyed the, uh, the, the uh, wild, wild traverse of the Goat Rocks nonetheless. I did get my, uh, my view of uh, Mount Rainier, 14,000 foot Mount Rainier the next morning though, which was great. The last couple of weeks of the hike, I spent hiking with these two lovely people from London, England, um, who had met on the trail. Um, bubble wrap on the left and no name on the right. We hooked up and, and I'm glad we did because uh, they were great companions. We had a lot of fun together. Um, the, the weather was continued to deteriorate. We were hiking through one snowstorm after another. It was getting pretty sketchy out there, pretty sketchy. And you know, we were still trying to push 25 miles a day, 20, 25 miles a day. And the terrain had gotten so much more precipitous I, you know, this is the Northern Cascades and after Snoqualmie Pass, especially, um, it was just wild out there and the snow just um, made it all that much more, more difficult going. Gotta love it though. Never seen anything like the Cascades. I've never hiked in the Cascades before. So finally, Oh, before I get to Stevens Pass, uh, at the late falls, the first of many nights of being harassed by marauding deer mice who chewed holes in everything, in our tents, uh, in our food bags, in our packs, um, Swiss cheese, everything. I guess Washington was known for this, but I had never heard of them. And uh, they were really a, a pest the entire rest of the way, every single night, no matter what. Finally, Stevens Pass where US Route 2 crosses uh, the, the uh, Cascades, the same Route 2 that ends up in Bangor, Maine. Um, I didn't know that the hike was going to end here, but uh, lo and behold, the, that's what happened. I'm a little shy, I'm a, a 10 days shy of the Canadian border. So because of a glitch in, in planning, um, uh, Bubble Wrap and, uh, and, uh, and No Name had a box waiting for them at the Skykomish post office. My wife Fran tried to get the darn thing from the post office. The whole rigmarole related to that. Well, she couldn't. That was on a Saturday morning. The post office didn't open again, open again till Monday at 11. We lost two precious days hanging around um, Sky Comish. So finally, it's now October 7th. We're late. We're late. And we're going into the most remote part of the entire Pacific Crest Trail. Uh, the Glacier Peak Wilderness and then uh, the Pesaten Wilderness. And uh, so we're, uh, we're running late. It, I had hoped to be done ideally 
by September 15th. My plan was September 26th. It's now October 8th and we've still got 10 days. So we, uh, we, we had to keep moving. We decided to keep moving. We left Stevens Pass in a god awful rainstorm. This is us uh, getting dropped off by Fran. Uh, it just poured all day. And that night, the temperatures plummeted and uh, everything froze and it started to snow. And um, well, it was a really bad night. My sleeping bag got wet. We, everything was wet. We were all pretty miserable. The next morning we got up though and we said, we're, we're, do, do you wanna keep going? And we did. And so we marched off into this storm that was snowing by the time, as we approached Grizzly Peak, um, it was probably snowing two inches an hour. And with the rain from the day before, there was just three, four inches of slush on the trail. Our feet were freezing, frozen with ice, and the snow was coming down. It was awful. Scott had gone, gotten ahead of us uh, that morning. Bubble wrap was behind me, and finally she caught up. And, and as she was approaching, I, I heard her wince audibly. And I turned to her and I said, are you okay? And she goes, no, no, I'm not. Um, my hands are frozen, my feet are frozen. And I said to her, you know, I, I, I'm not okay either. And I was thinking about all my wet gear. She had wet gear, we all had wet gear. And, and, it, and we were walking headlong into greater danger. And we, we just decided to, to turn around at that point. Now we tried to call for Scott. We hiked ahead to, to try to find him. No go, he pushed into the storm. We retreated set up a tent, waited for Scott. Um, but by the time uh, early afternoon came, it's like, well, no, we, we, gotta, we gotta go. So we broke camp and uh, hustled back through two feet of snow back to Stevens Pass. And uh, oh, so we, we, we waited out the whole next day, hoping, hoping, hoping that Scott was okay. And there was a whole bunch of people out on the trail stranded. Um, hikers were retreating from the mountains. Finally, we were all asleep late that night, midnight. Scott had hiked uh, 26 miles back to Stevens Pass and ended up at the hotel we were at. So the story ended well. The hike ended there. It was too late. The weather was too bad. I, I, I guess in the end, we probably weren't as prepared as we should have been, but I didn't want to be out there that late. We shouldn't have been out there that late. So we called it. We called it headed to Seattle and uh, got some food and beer and uh, everybody went their separate ways. So I've hiked everything in blue, in red and in green, 2,477 miles. I had hoped to go back and finish the Pacific Crest Trail this year, but COVID had other plans, made travel really impossible. Um, but, you know, I, I hope to get out there this year. We'll see, we'll see because uh, I don't like leaving things uh, unfinished like this, but I did find a quote by Colin Fletcher. You may remember him uh, from the 60s and 70s, the father of uh, modern backpacking. There is a powerful human compulsion to leave things tied up in neat little bundles, but every journey except your last has an open end. And any journey of value is above all a chapter in a personal odyssey. Its end is not so much a goal attained as another point in a continuing process. And the important thing at the end of a journey is to keep moving forward, refreshed with as little pause as possible. So I'll, uh, I'll take that for what it is. I hope to get out and finish it. Um, we'll see, we'll see. Um, I've got other things in mind, but I can tell you about that at, a, as an, at another time. So listen, I hope you've enjoyed my journey on the Pacific Crest Trail. I had a blast. It was an adventure of a lifetime. Um, uh, I, I have memories forever of the PCT. So thank you very much. You've been great. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you have any uh, questions for me, please uh, contact me on Facebook or via email. Thank you again very much. Take care.